So what kind of power is the gospel? It's, it's the power of truth. So this is out of a book called Desire of Ages, page 759. So what do you think about this one? So talking about this idea of power. How are we, as Christians today, to use power? Desire of Ages 759. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one cast a pebble to the earth. Now how hard is it for, for me to do that? That isn't hard at all. No effort at all. And what kind of law is involved? And, kind of law is involved? And, and that's ultimately a beautiful analogy because how will the wicked die in the end? Because God holds on to them or he lets them go. And he's the source of all life. And so as he lets go, they fall into oblivion. That's it. It's how, that's how easy it would have been for God to eliminate Satan and all his sympathizers. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. Meditate on that for a minute, folks. Compelling power. Compelling power is not restraining power. Do you understand the difference between compelling and restraining? Compelling is forcing people Restraining is stopping people. There is a righteous use of physical power. The righteous use of physical power is to restrain evil, hedge of protection. They can be battering against the walls, trying to come in and destroy. It's righteous to re hold the wall, to restrain evil. There's lots of places people restrain evil righteously. And this is Romans chapter 13 when Paul talks about God's ordaining of human governments. The purpose of the human government is not to compel righteousness but to restrain evil. To stop the mobs from burning down neighborhoods. That's a righteous use of power. To restrain evil. That's not what this is talking about. This is about compelling power. Forcing people to do things that they're not persuaded to do. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. Um, not that all compelling actions are necessarily against the kingdom of God, but the compelling itself is not God's way. For instance, we pay taxes in this country via what kind of power? Compelling power. You are compelled to do it because if you don't, you will be imprisoned. When God brought um, forth, had Israel bring forth resources for the temple, it was not compelling. It was offerings only. He did not compel. You must do this or you will be beaten. No. He called for offerings. And the offerings came. That's how the temple was supported, through tithes and offerings. Not through compelling power. Okay. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means. Our means are to do what? Present the principles of goodness, mercy, and love. God's government is moral. Now, no, here comes the power. And Truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Truth and love prevail. Truth and love prevail. Can you ever get more love by threatening to kill people who don't love you? Can you get more love? Ever, ever, never. You can't get more love by having a mob and burning down a building. You will never get more love doing that. You will never get more love going on rampages and, and assaulting people. You cannot get more love doing that. Truth and love. Truth combined with love. By the way, love without truth is vulnerable. In Eden, Adam and Eve had love for God. And it was a love more pure and without flaw than the love we have today. Everybody agree with me? But that love alone did not keep them safe. 
because they did not have truth sufficiently understood and incorporated into their character that protected them from believing lies. Lies broke the circle of love and trust when they believed them. So love alone is not sufficient. It has to be love combined with truth. This is the prevailing. That's why the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and love. Truth without love, though, becomes a bludgeon that we can injure people with. Have you seen that? Bring some truth to bear on somebody and crush them with it with no love. That's not from the Spirit of God either. It's truth and love combined. So from the indwelling Spirit, the Bible teaches that the power to be used, the method to achieve God's goal is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. We can never achieve God's goal. Remember what God wants. He wants your love. He wants your trust. He wants your loyalty. He wants your friendship. He wants your heart devotion. None of these things can be achieved by threatening to kill you if you don't give them. None of these can be achieved by compelling power, by threats of punishment. None of these can be achieved by anything any government in the history of the world can do. Doesn't matter just the U.S. government, any government. They cannot go into Congress and Senate and pass laws that say you will love your neighbor and achieve love for your neighbor. They can't do it. So why, why doesn't compelling power work? Let me, let me put it to you. What impact does force, threat, coercion have upon a person's mind, heart, character, their self? What, what, what reaction do people have to force, threat, and coercion? It increases fear. Your fear level goes up. It decreases trust. I trust the person who's threatened me less. It increases resentment. Resentment goes up. It decreases love. I love them less. Can you all, are you all with me? You feel it. And all of that results in either loss of individuality, where you surrender and become this passive person. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Whatever you say. Yes, sir. No, sir. Whatever you say, sir. You become a passive person. Just to avoid any, okay, don't do anything, uh, anything you say, I'll do, just don't hurt me. You identify with the aggressor, or you rebel. You go into violence and you rebel. That's the only outcome from using this type of compelling power. What impact does the power of truth and love presented with freedom, liberty, the principles of God, have upon a person? Genuine freedom. This is why the constitutional protections of liberties are so important. You understand individuality cannot grow without freedom. Love cannot grow without freedom. Truth does not advance in environments where you are abused for speaking truth. It shuts down people's pursuit of truth for fear. So, what impact does truth, love, and freedom have? It decreases fear. When you experience, you can really speak freely, and you're still loved and accepted. You're not going to be punished for it. Your fear goes down. This is not only in society, it's in marriages. How many marriages have I seen where people live in fear of what their spouse will say or how they'll respond if we actually speak what I think? So they're constantly modulating and walking on eggshells in their relationship because they don't want to upset the other person. It's not healthy. When you actually experience freedom to speak, fear goes down. When you actually experience truth and love and freedom, truth, I'm loved, I'm free, trust goes up. I trust these people. And when wrongs occur in that environment, we are much more readily to forgive the wrong, which eradicates resentment. And we generally have growth and love in these environments. We love more. Which all of this together leads to restoration of a person's individuality, the development of their self-governance, the increase of their confidence, and their growing up into the full stature of Jesus Christ. 
Understand why Satan is so insistent that the church teach that God's kingdom runs on the methods of the world. Coercion, force, threat. It obstructs completely his healing plan. Remember 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we don't wage wars the world does. The weapons we use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish every argument, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought. That war is a battle for our mind. My blog this week, if you haven't read it, it's on learning to discern. And I start out by informing people, we're in a war for your mind. Your mind is under assault in our society today. Do you feel it? Do you feel the pressure? And it's assault from both sides, from all sides. And do you realize that the vast majority of people assaulting your mind have no interest in you learning to reason and think? They have no interest in you coming to your own conclusion. They want to propagandize you. They want to indoctrinate you. It's a war for your mind. In the blog this week, I go through and provide some tools that you can use that can prevent your mind from being indoctrinated and propagandized and give you the ability to discern and think for yourself. So what weapons do we use? We use the weapons of truth, love, and wield them in freedom. Is it possible that people could think they're promoting the gospel but actually promoting a false gospel? Remember in Galatians, even if an angel of light comes with the gospel other than we preach, let them be eternally condemned. Yeah, there are other gospels out there that aren't the true gospel. What happens if we accept a different version of the gospel than the true gospel? There are design laws involved here, folks. The law of worship, the law of exertion. We become like what we admire and worship. We actually change neurobiologically and characterologically. And as we exert and practice those principles, we wire new pathways into our brain to become habitual, and we are slowly transformed. These are design laws. If we persist in promoting a false gospel, we become hardened in alienation to God. If we are lovers of the truth, we may, be, and most of us have had this experience, tonight, uh, do we not? We may have had experiences where at one time we look back and go, you know, I used to believe that wrong. That does not harden you to have beliefs that are wrong. What hardens you is a refusal when better understandings come along to accept them, to grow. We are finite beings. None of us know all things. The healthy person, the godly person, is a person who has a heart that loves truth and has a desire to the spirit of truth, says, Lord, I want to grow in truth. I know there's things I don't even understand or maybe some things I got wrong. Lead me in the way everlasting. Eliminate the distortions. Replace them with truth. And as we grow, we will let go of that. But the people that get hardened are the ones who say, I can see, I understand, but I like this way better. And they reject the truth. They won't advance. Then they harden themselves in alienation. 